As you can see, I'm not alone in this. I'm, I'm really here to represent all the investigators on this international collaboration looking at um, lentiviral gene therapy for X-linked chronic granulomatous disease. Um, but you know, So I'm just one of many. Um, so I have no conflicts of interest, um, but Donald Cohn, Adrian Thrasher, David Williams, and Harry, and, uh, Harry Malik, who are all um, investigators of the study, are also members of the Scientific Advisory Board of Orchard Therapeutics, um, as well as Bobby Gaspar. And Orchard Therapeutics has obtained an exclusive option to license from Genethon the know-how from this lentiviral vector um, for, for CGD. Okay, so um, I know that um, gene therapy hasn't really been discussed in, in this session, so I'll just give you a brief background on, on what gene therapy is and what it entails. So um, just a, a quick background on, on treatment of primary immune deficiencies. We know that hematopoietic stem cell transplants or allogeneic transplants, meaning getting bone marrow from an unaffected individual and transplanting it into a patient with CGD, um, or another primary immune deficiency has been successfully applied since the 1960s. And so this has been done for many primary immune deficiencies, um, uh, uh, many more than are listed here, and one of them is chronic granulomatous disease. And the reason transplant works for this disease is because if you take a stem cell, so this is a hematopoietic tree, and it kind of shows you how a stem cell becomes different cells in the blood system. If you take a, um, a stem cell that is healthy from an unaffected individual and you put it into somebody, um, somebody else who maybe has a disease of their blood system, that new stem cell could give rise to all the cells down below and of importance to CGD, it can give rise to new neutrophils that are healthy, so that have proper NADPH oxidase activity. So this is the principle behind um, kind of traditional allogeneic transplant. <laughs> However, there's many limitations to transplant. Um, first of all, you know, you have to find a donor, um, matched unaffected related donors, so meaning um, bone marrow from a family member who isn't affected, is only available for around 10 to 15 percent of patients. If you search outside of the family, um, if you want to try to get a 10 out of 10 matched unrelated donor, it's only available for about 60% of patients if you're of European descent. And this is much lower for some other ethnic groups. So, you know, you can imagine if you're from a mixed or, or rare population of individuals, you have a lesser chance of getting a HLA matched donor. Um, other um, limitations include individuals who have severe infections or chronic lung disease may not tolerate the conditioning regimen that's needed for transplant. Um, um, they may get more ill or their infections can get worse or it could worsen their chronic lung disease. There's also social, economic, and insurance issues that are associated with bone marrow transplant. You know, it's, it's not inexpensive and it takes a lot of time um, to get admitted and stay in the hospital until you engraft. So, you know, a lot of things come into consideration. And finally, the major uh, limitation of traditional allogeneic transplant is the unwanted immune response between a patient and transplanted cells. So when you receive cells from a donor, um, you can either reject those cells, so that would be a, a fit graft failure, or there can be some immune cells that come over with the graft and they can re react against the patient, which is called graft versus host disease, and it can manifest in, in quite a bit of morbidity and mortality. So we're often, um, with transplant, dealing with this yin and yang of, of trying to um, you know, balance rejection with gra uh, graft versus host disease, okay? So what if we could try to avoid some of these challenges of allogeneic transplant um, by, instead of using somebody else's bone marrow cells, what if you took your own um, stem cells, which we call autologous stem cells, and what if we fixed them and gave them back to you so that you no longer have the side effects of, of allogeneic transplant? And so if you know the gene that is causing your disease, let's say it's, you know, in, you know for x linked CGD, it, it you know, would be uh, CYBB, um, let's say. So let's say, you know, you know that you have a mutation in a specific gene. You could introduce a normal copy of that gene to your own stem cells. And once you do that, those stem cells would engraft and and be long-living, uh, long meaning they could give rise to more stem cells when needed, 
And they would also differentiate into all the cells in your blood system. So that, that um, correct copy of the gene would be passed down to all of its progeny cells below, okay? Um, and so this is kind of the principle behind um, uh, a gene therapy. So how this would practically look is um, you could have an individual bring them into the hospital um, you would harvest stem cells from that individual, either through bone marrow harvest or through peripheral blood um, phoresis. Those stem cells would be taken to the lab where they're purified and they're given the correct copy of the gene. And that takes about, you know, two to four days. And so in that period, the patient is in the hospital getting conditioning to make some room in their bone marrow. And at the end of that time, you give back the cells that were, that's their own, but that now contain a corrective copy of the gene. So th this could all be done in kind of a three to five day period. And things have now been, you know, so advanced that we no longer rush it. So instead of giving the cells right away fresh, we can actually collect the cells and have patients go home. And then we would treat the cells in the lab and the, then, the, then those cells can undergo all the release criteria testing that we need to do to make sure that they're pure, that they're you know, not contaminated, that they actually got a copy of the, of the gene. Um, and then these, these frozen cells can be given six to eight weeks later um, when we've you know, kind of validated those cells. And then at that time, the patient can come back in for conditioning and then receive the cells. And so how do we get this normal copy of a cell, I mean, of, a, of DNA into cells? So the way that we've been doing it is using viral delivery. And the way that this works is we've basically hijacked um, a virus's ability to integrate their own DNA into a, a, a person's genes. So for example, HIV or, or, um, is a virus that can integrate some of its own DNA into your chromosomes. And so we've taken um, the, the essentially the HIV virus and we've stripped it of all its infect um, bad properties, things that would give you the disease, and we instead have replaced it with a corrective copy of a therapeutic gene. So let's say this is a viral vector, it's been stripped of all of its bad properties, and it instead carries a corrective copy of DNA. Um, that ve vector can enter your cells, and it undergoes something called reverse transcription because it needs to make a copy of the RNA that it has so, so that it now has double-stranded DNA like you have in your cells. This double-stranded DNA can then enter into your nucleus, which, which is where your DNA lives, and it would integrate into your DNA. And the good result, the kind of the, the good um, effect of this is that you, you now can express um, this protein properly, which you never expressed before. And all of these um, can now be transmitted to any daughter cells or progeny cells that come from that main cell. And so if we kind of zoom in at what this might look, at, look like, let's pretend your squiggly lines are just your DNA, a random area of DNA. Um, we would then integrate our therapeutic gene somewhere in your DNA, and this would give rise to a therapeutic protein. So um, in the case of X-linked CGD, it would be a therapeutic GP91 Fox protein. And so this corrective DNA will remain as a stable element of the cell's chromosomes, and also it'll be passed to all daughter cells. So some considerations um, for the current trial. So these are, um, the current trial has been based on things that we've learned um, from previous trials. So we know that when you integrate um, genes using viral vectors, that the expression is not normally regulated. So meaning, um, you know, in our normal DNA, something needs to tell it to turn off or on or stay always on or stay always off unless something happens. But when you use um, viral vectors, the, the, the gene tends to stay on all the time, okay? And so um, one way in which we've gotten around this, so, so for example, there's a light switch there and it's always on. And so one way in which we've tried to improve upon this is that in the current trial, this light switch is not a generic always on light switch. It's, a, it's actually a chimeric light switch that tells it mostly to turn on in, once it is in myeloid cells or neutrophils. Okay, so we want this gene to be working in, in the neutrophils that are defective. The other, the other thing that could happen is what if this light switch that is always on integrates near a proto-oncogene? So it could 
in addition to turning on your therapeutic gene, it could turn on a nearby oncogene that it randomly integrated near. And so one thing that has been improved um, with recent gene therapy trials is the use of um, more recent lentiviral vectors, so kind of ad more advanced viral vectors that tend not to integrate near proto-oncogenes. And so, you know, I'll just quickly show that with the older um, forms of viral vectors, there were leukemic events that occurred in, um, in many of the gene therapy um, trials for primary immune deficiency. And you can see that for CGD, it occurred in three out of nine patients in the early trials using older generation viral vectors. So another consideration for, the, for gene therapy trials in general is um, do patients need conditioning? And so, um, this is a slide showing, well, I'm from UCLA, so it's USC versus UCLA stem cell colors. But um, so let, let's say a patient's diseased stem cells are from USC. Um, I shouldn't say that because I went there for medical school, but anyway, so, so let's say they're, they're, you know, gold and red. And, you know, stem cells, um, you know, for most primary immune deficiencies, there's nothing wrong with them. And so... If you don't, so if you go to the left, if you don't give them anything to clear some room in their bone marrow space, they're just there. They, they, they're healthy and they stay there. And so if you give them additional um, gene-modified cells, there's no place for them to go, okay? And then in the middle is full myeloblation. So if you fully get rid of the bone marrow space or open up the bone marrow space, then maybe more of the corrective um, blue and yellow our gene um, modified cells can engraft. And then on the right is a reduced intensity, so you can imagine kind of in the middle. So you, you create a little bit of space so that some, you know, some of the new cells have, have place to go. And so one of, the con one of the other considerations for the current trial is whether or not conditioning is important. And we did learn from the earlier gene therapy trials for CGD, um, three of which are shown here, that um, you can see that none of these um, trials use conditioning on the second column, um, and then none of them have significant engraft engraftment, which is in the second to last column. So, uh, you know, common denominator in these early clinical trials was even though we can get the vector in to the cells, um, that we needed some amount of bone marrow conditioning, okay? So um, I know this has been reviewed a little bit already, but the current management for CGD is antibacterial and antifungal prophylaxis with aggressive and timely treatment of infections. Um, stem cell transplant may be curative, but is limited by appropriate match donor and complications such as graft-versus-host disease. Um, and so from, from um, uh, patients that, are, that either have skewed lionization or who have been transplanted, we know that um, corrected NADPH activity in 10% or more of the circulating myeloid cells will provide a clinical benefit. So this is um, just an over kind of a bird's eye view of how this trial is organized. So patients um, were treated both um, in the UK at um, three institutions, as well as the US um, at uh, UCLA, Boston Children's, and the uh, NIH. Um, and um, the vector was obtained from Genathon and Epokesi, and with insertion site analysis done by Rick Bushman at University of Pennsylvania, which I'll go over in a little bit. So this data really includes um, many individuals from both the U.S. and the U.K. studies. And um, all eligible X-linked CGD subjects, they underwent CD34 cell mobilization or bone marrow isolation. And these cells were then taken to the lab and transduced with the lentiviral vector, which we're call calling G1XCGD. Um, they also received cytoreductive conditioning with pharmacokinetic um, pharmacokinetic adjusted busulfan and autologous transplantation. So the cytoreductive conditioning um, with busulfan was, is to clear a little bit of space in the marrow so that the new cells have a place to go. And then they received autologous transplants, meaning these cells came from each person individually. Um, they all received treatment with the same G1 XCGD lentiviral vector. And below is just showing kind of a schematic of what that looks like. Um, so the, the human GP91FOX, that's the corrective DNA that we want to introduce into each of the cells. And you can see right before them, there's a cat G CFES, a Cathepsin G CFES promoter. So this is that chimeric promoter that I mentioned earlier where it helps, um, it's activated more in myeloid cells and not just in, in any cell. So it's 
we were, we're using a, a, that on switch that's a little bit more specific for, for myeloid cells that's relevant for XCGD. Um, and then all subjects are followed for two years post-gene therapy. So in this um, set of slides, I'm actually going to be um, showing data on nine patients, um, both in the U.S. and U.K. And the reason we've chosen these nine patients is because they all have at least 12 months of follow-up after gene therapy, um, since we don't want to make any conclusions earlier than a, than a year post-gene therapy. The primary obje objectives of the study were, first of all, safety, so evaluation of safety, and then also determination of efficacy and stability by biochemical and functional reconstitution in progeny of engrafted cells at 12 months. So we're looking at both safety and the, the efficacy of, of this viral vector. Our secondary objectives included an assessment of immunologic reconstitution, so you know how the immune system comes back after transplant, assessment of hematopoietic stem cell transduction and engraftment, and overall health assessments. So um, here I'm listing the common eligibility criteria. Um, patients were eligible if they were male with X-linked CGD and they were greater than 23 months of age. Um, they had to have confirmed CGD diagno XCGD diagnosis by DNA sequencing and also they had to have um, uh, functional evidence as evidenced by absent or reduced um, activity of NADPH oxidase. Um, we are also aiming for individuals who were the most ill and who would most likely benefit from this. So um, those enrolled had to have at least one prior ongoing or refractory severe infection and or inflammatory complication that can often be associated with X-linked CGD that required um, hospitalization despite conventional therapy. Um, um, individuals had to have no 10 out of 10 HLA matched donor and they, did, they could not have co-infection with um, these viruses that could um, compromise their health during immune suppression. And then they, of course, had to have written informed consent and assent. So um, there's two main um, procedure schemas in this trial. So it started off as a fresh cell procedure. And um, this, this means that patients, uh, after consenting, they came in for their, uh, uh, an initial collection of peripheral blood stem cells. That was, that, that was kind of their backup harvest, meaning we would save those, and if anything happened during the gene therapy and they needed it, we would give that back. So they would come for just the backup harvest, they would go home for a month, and they would come back again, get mobilized, and we would then collect stem cells again from them and use that to treat them uh, through gene therapy. Um, and so in this fresh, fresh protocol, um, the patients, patients would stay after collection, and you can see in the bottom is the bottom of that arrow. So those, the bottom is showing what we're doing to the stem cells in the lab, and then the top is showing what is simultaneously being done for the patient, meaning they're undergoing conditioning at the same time that we're processing the cells in the lab. And then um, after four days, they are given back, they are now gene-modified stem cells. So after, so, so most of the patients that I'll be pre um, presenting on was, were treated under this initial protocol. And then we started to modify it because we realized that we can actually freeze cells after they've been gene modified. And then we can make sure that those cells have met, met all the quality um, checks that we do on them before we give them back to the patient. So the main difference in this frozen cell procedure is that patients came in only one time for collection and we just collected enough for both backup and for, for gene therapy. And then they just went home after that. And during that time, during that you know, four to six week time, we would treat the cells, we would freeze them, and then we would make sure that the cell quality was fine. And then after we made sure everything was fine, the patient would come back for a second admission, um, receive busulfan conditioning, and then followed by infusion of the corrected cells. So these are the subject demographics um, of, the, of the nine patients that I'll be presenting on. Uh, you can see that the age ranges from as young as two years old um, up to 24, I'm sorry, 27. Um, if you look at the prior medical history column, you know, I won't go through all of them, but you can see that they were all quite ill. They had a lot of complications, um, infection complications of their X-linked CGD. And then if you look at the right column, you'll see that that's 
going over their status, their, their, their status at gene therapy. And there are a few that, had, that were pretty stable, but most of them were, still had ongoing complications of their disease. So again, emphasizing that we're really trying to address those that had ongoing or, or kind of refractory disease. Um, these are the drug product characteristics. When I say drug, drug product, that's the stem cells that have been now gene modified. So you can see that most of the patients were treated under the FRESH protocol, but there, there are three that received um, frozen product. Um, the next column is looking at their cell dose, so how many stem cells did they receive? And that ranges from around you know, 6 million to 33 million per kilogram. The next column is looking at their vector copy number. And so what vector copy number represents is it's an average of how many, I guess, vector copies, so virus copies the cells received. So as an example, the first one says 1.5. So that would be, on average, each cell got an average of 1.5 copies of the virus. So that probably means that some got none, some got three, some got one, some got four, some, but it averages out to 1.5. Okay, so that's what the vector copy number represents. Um, and it's something that you can follow over time. So you can see, does the virus that you put in there, does that stay there? Because it, it should if it integrated into a stem cell. And the last column is looking at their colony forming units. So, you know, I showed you that hematopoietic tree in the very beginning. So a stem cell is supposed to make many different types of cells below it. And what you can do is you can take these gene-modified stem cells and you can plate them really thinly on a really a special media, and those stem cells will then grow into what they are supposed to become. So some will become little clusters of red blood cells, some will become clusters of you know uh, white cells, and so you can look at each, you can collect each of those and make sure that the gene is in them. So it wasn't done for the U, the UK patients, but you can see that for all the US patients, that the percent of cells um, that have the gene marking is quite high. Okay, so we know that the gene is getting into the stem cell, and those stem cells are forming progeny cells that it should be. So this is a summary, um, kind of a graphical summary of that. So on the top left is the number of um, stem cells that patients got per kilo. So it ranges from 5 to 35 million per kilo. On the right is their average vector, vector copy number, ranging from around, I think, 0.8 up to 5. Um, on the bottom left is the percent positive um, PCR CFUs, which I just explained, the, the different colonies. You can see those all cluster tightly together. And on the bottom right is, is looking at their busulfan dose. So it turns out when you, you know, we all metabolize drugs at different rates. And so if you, if you give busulfan that's adjusted to the, to the rate at which an individual patient metabolizes that drug, we can actually get a very close uh, we can get all the patients to have a very close goal for busulfan, so no one is getting too much and no one is getting too little. Okay. So this is the safety summary um, for the nine patients. There were no infusion-related adverse events. Um, there were typical conditioning-related events like um, neutropenia, so your neutrophils go down when you get um, uh, conditioning, uh, but this was transient. Um, Many of them got thrombocytopenia, so low platelets, and then many of them had mucositis, so kind of sloughing of, of the mucous membranes that resolves you know, over two, a two to three week period. There were two patients that died post-gene therapy from complications related to their pre-existing comorbidities unrelated to gene therapy. So UK01 um, passed away from hyperacute sterile pneumonitis nine weeks after gene therapy, and this individual had already very extensive lung disease that um, required actually a pneumonectomy, so cutting out part of the lungs because of, of fungal pneumonia. And then there was an, another patient, N105, um, that actually died because of um, he, had a, he had a fungal infection in the brain and there was bleeding into that site um, that could not be stopped. Um, there was also one serious adverse ev event um, that fully resolved in one of the UK patients. And this is what we're calling immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, or IRIS. And so this can happen sometimes when um, you can imagine that if you didn't have a functioning immune system, you may have maybe some latent infections or things we didn't know about. And then if you reconstitute that immune system or replace that immune system with something that's working, they suddenly kind of, kind of overreact. 
um, to everything that's going on. And so, so we transiently saw some iris in one of the patients. Um, we also did tests for neutrophil activity. This is just showing um, what we did for one of the patients. But on the left is the more traditional nitro blue tetrazoleum test. And what this does is, so we can look at first at the normal control at the top. So when neutrophils are, are in a dish and you don't stimulate them, they're, at least in this assay, they're kind of this red and pink color. If you then stimulate them and expose them to um, a substance called nitro blue tetrazoleum, that if you have functional NADPH oxidase, that actually turns it into a bluish color. So you can see in a normal control that all of the cells end up having this bluish tint because it oxidizes that, that chemical. Um, in the bottom is one of our first patients that was treated. You could see that um, on the left two bottom ones, those are um, his cells that were stimulated um, pre-gene therapy. So you could see nothing, nothing is a hint of blue. Everything is like a pink red color. And on the right two, are um, stimulated cells three months post gene therapy. So you can start to see that some of them have this bluish hue around, around um, the darker red, the granules. And then a second way in which we now look at um, of neutrophil activity is called the dihydrorhodamine assay. So we call it DHR, and you're gonna hear me mention that more often. Um, and this is, a way of quanti this is a quantitative way of looking at which neutrophils are working. It's very similar to nitro blue tetrazoleum in that when something, when a substance gets oxidized, it turns to a different color that we can pick up. But this is just doing it by a single, uh, by cell by cell method, um, using a flow cytometer that can pick up that fluorescent marker. So um, on the bottom, we'll start with the bottom right, that's a healthy control. You can see that when the cells are stimulated, all the cells in that box, so 98% of them, now have a, have a different fluorescent color because they're, they're oxidizing the DHR. Uh, and, then, and then the top, um, and then the other three ones are post-gene therapy. So you could see for this same individual, one month post-gene therapy, one year post-gene therapy, and two years post-gene therapy, that he has around 30% of cells that are functional. functional. So this is um, a graph of the neutrophil DHR over time. Um, you can see that most of them have, you know, have pretty stable DHR expression um, um, after gene therapy. Um, there is one patient, that orange one, um, that had a drop in, in um, his DHR activity to um, less than 1%. Um, and, and so, you know, of note, we know that that individual actually required three mobilizations to collect enough stem cells. So we don't know if there was something related to the health of his stem cells to begin with, or that patient was also being treated with an antibiotic that we know suppresses um, um, myeloid cells or engraftment. And so we don't know if one or both of those things together made it so that he lost some of his gene marking over time. Um, and then I'll go over his clinical status in, in the next few slides. Um, this is the vector copy number over time. So this is looking at the, the copies of the gene that are in the cells over time. Um, you can see for most of the patients, it stays pretty consistent um, for, for, for two years after gene, one to two years after gene therapy. Um, the, the dip is the, that one patient I just mentioned, and that lower point is um, the patient who passed away early um, because of the pneumonitis. We can also take different immune cells from the blood and see what the vector copy number is. So this pretty much shows the same thing. Um, if you just look at all the, the green and blue and orange lines, you can see that the, their vector copy number remains similar in all, their, in all those cells. And then the other thing that we wanna make sure of is um, the, the vector integration site analysis. And so it's just a bunch of lines, but what it really tells us is, um, is, is this vector getting into the genome randomly? So we, we, we don't like it when it only goes into one place or if we have a, have a predominant clone, meaning a cell with an integration always in the same place because um, uh, it could mean that it integrated near a proto-oncogene or it's just that it, it, you know, we, we know that diversity is better. And so th this is on a log scale, so it's just showing at different time points for these individuals in different cell types that the diversity is very high um, across many different cells. 
Um, and then this one's, a, this one's kind of a, a little bit complicated and kind of weird to, to read um, plot, but it's looking at CPG methylation. And the reason this was done is because in some of the older gene therapy trials for CGD, we found that there was silencing of that gene that we put in. So, you know, when our, when our genes, when they're processed into protein, it undergoes many different modifications, and some modifications can actually turn off that expression. And so um, what this is showing is that that silencing was not occurring. And so if you look just at the, if you look at the bottom parts that say GP91, 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 and you look above that, you can see there's no bars, meaning there is no CPG methylation, meaning there is no silencing of the gene we put in. And then these are the patient outcome results um, for the nine patients. So um, there were two patients who, who died, um, and then the re there are um, six patients actually who are clinically well and off prophylaxis for, for CGD disease. Um, so actually that includes, um, uh, so I'm, I'm sorry, so, so actually the, the one patient that, that remained on um, prophylaxis is U103, and the reason that he remains on prophylaxis is because he had low T cells that was pre-existing before gene therapy. And so he, need, he needs it for a different reason, but it's not for CGD-related um, prophylaxis. And then I'll just end with a um, representative example patient case that actually Dr. Malik shared with me. Um, this is a patient that was treated at the NIH. Um, he's a 24-year-old man with XTGD, followed at the NIH. His clinical history is significant for multiple bacterial and fungal lung infections, um, previous lung lobe resection, granulomatous inflammation of the liver, small and large intestines, and chronic hydroadenitis. So he had a lot of issues, both infectious and inflammatory, going on. Um, he had an ongoing infection not responsive to antibiotic therapy. So in, two, in um, October of 2016, he developed inocutus uh, fungus, which is a felinus group fungus, um, that resulted in a right-sided pneumonia um, that persisted and worsened despite um, therapy, and this was proven on, on lung biopsies. He then received gene therapy in mid-June of 2017. So first I'll show you the DHR um, results. So you can see on the top right that pre-gene therapy, there's no um, DHR activity, which would appear in that right box. And then if you look below the next two boxes, the first one on the left is the three months post-gene therapy where he has about 45% DHR positive neutrophils, which is great. And then 12 months post-gene therapy, he maintains his DHR um, in his neutrophils, and that's around 46%. So it's maintained from three months to, to 12 months. And then we'll now look at a series of chest CT scans showing the pneumonia. So the, you know, the lung should be kind of this black color with little white speckles throughout because it's aerated and air is dark on, on chest CT. And you can see on the top left when he was first diagnosed with the um, inocutus that there's that area on the left that looks like white patchiness. And if you look at the next several CTs going to the right, you can see that white patchiness gets worse. And this is despite treatment that's appropriate for that pneumonia. He then received gene therapy in June of 2017. So you can see that's a CT scan right below, like um, I think right before gene therapy or right after. And then you can see that even just um, a few months later that that white patchiness is starting to improve. And this is a, a follow-up CT just six months post-gene therapy. And you can see that those functional neutrophils were able to help him resolve that pneumonia. So there's just some residual scarring that can occur with such a bad pneumonia, but all that whiteness has, has really gone away. So this was, this was a really great case to kind of see how functioning neutrophils can help um, clinically. So in summary, um, there are seven out of nine patients um, who have been treated with this lentiviral product who remain alive and well at greater than or equal to 12 months. So that's a total of 2,036 patient days after gene therapy. There have been no new CGD-related infections reported in any of the living patients. There were also no vector-related complications, uh, meaning that when we look at the diversity in which 
the vector integrates into the genome, it's still very highly variable, and there's no single clone that, that came out. There is also no silencing of the gene that we put in. Um, six out of seven patients demonstrated stable vector copy number over 12 months. At 12 months, six out of seven patients demonstrated persistence, meaning 16 to 46 percent oxidase positive, positive neutrophils in circulation. Um, at the last follow-up, six are no longer receiving CGD-related prophylactic antibiotic prophylaxis. And so this study demonstrates proof of concept for the G1XCGD lentiviral vector, transduce CD34 cells as a treatment for X-linked CGD. And so um, there are still additional studies that are ongoing to formally assess clinical efficacy and safety, um, but I'm reporting on kind of the data that we have now. So, of course, um, you know, thank you to, to all the investigators, but most importantly to patients, their families, and our referring physicians, um, and the clinical support teams and our cell processing facility staff. So I'd be happy to take any questions that people have. And, and Dr. Malik is here, too, so he can help answer questions. So um, one of the questions is, how long will it take to have gene therapy be the standard of care? So, so that's a great question. Um, you know, in, in order to be standard of care, it needs to be better than the care that we're already giving. Um, so, so right now, the standard of care, as a, 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 in terms of definitive cure for CGD, is allogeneic st uh, stem cell transplant. And so really, the onus um, for this trial is, for, is we have to show that it's better. So not only is it more safe, but more efficacious um, um, for individuals. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure when that will be. I don't know if Dr. Malik has any thoughts on, on the timeline of that, but, you know, I, I would imagine it would be a, at least several years away. Yeah. So, for example, for, for ADA skid, um, so a different immune deficiency, I think those gene therapy, there have been so many people treated under those trials that have shown that it works well and consistently and that it's, you know, in, it's safe. Um, and so it, many people are considering that to become standard of care for that particular immune deficiency. I don't think that we're quite there yet for CGD, but it, I, I think that is the goal. Um, and then the second question was, does gene therapy correct the carrier trait? Um, so, you know, I, I think this is referring to the fact that, you know, we used to think that carriers were healthy and you know, we didn't need to worry about anything, but, you know, it turns out in a study that came out from the NIH that carriers can have issues, in addition to infections, they can have issues with autoimmunity. And so, you know, right now we're not at the, at the time when, we're not at the, um, we're not at a place where we can treat the carrier defect because it's unclear what percentage of correction we would need in order to address those issues. So, you know, for example, you know, our, if we were to look at DHR, you know, we're getting 20 to 50 percent of cells that are corrected. A carrier may already have 50 percent of cells that are, that are, have normal DHR. So the question, we, we don't, I don't think we know the physiology enough to know how much more do we need to do and will this even help. 